Hey everybody, in today's video I'm going to show you how you can create a dashboard like this in Excel that tracks multiple economic indicators such as unemployment, GDP, interest, inflation, housing starts, and stock market, and create different visuals for each one of the different charts. And I'm going to use Power Query to pull in this data and I'm going to show you how you can make it so it'll automatically refresh based on new data so that you you weren't constantly having to change and update the links. So I'm going to clear this out and go to a template that I've just started here where I've got my different indicators and I've got the links that I'm going to use in Power Query. So if you want a copy to these exact links, uh, refer to the description in the video. I've got a link to a post related to this where you can follow along and use those links specifically. But basically I'm using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Fred website, and Yahoo Finance to pull in all this information. I'm also using uh, a variable for today's date. So I'm using a text function to put in a year, month, and date format. And the purpose of that is in some of these URLs, like the Fred ones, I've got that variable being linked to right there. And so the purpose of that is, you know, if you're updating this data weeks or month, months later, this variable is automatically updating and you aren't going to be having to manually change this link to reflect the, the current date. So that's the purpose of that. And what I'm going to do also is create some named ranges for these fields. So for unemployment, Call it unemployment. GDP is going to be GDP. This is the interest. Inflation. Housing. And stock market. So now what I'm going to do is start loading this data into Power Query. So I'm going to copy the unemployment rate link. Under the data tab, hit from web. And this is going to launch the Power Query window. I'm going to paste that link into there, hit OK. And now what I'm going to need to do is select the table that I want to use. So there's a document table here, which is not what I want. This civilian unemployment rate looks to be correct. So I'm going to hit transform data before I actually load this back into Excel. Because there's a few adjustments that I'm going to make to this. And so I don't need all these columns, so I'm going to remove these other ones. Right-click, remove columns. So, so I've just got the total unemployment rate. And what I'm going to do also is split this column. So I've got month and year, not just all of it uh, jammed together. So right-click, split column by delimiter. And it's going to default to a space, which is fine with me because I would... I want to cut it right where the where the space is. I'm going to hit OK. And now I'm just going to rename this. So this is month. And this is year. And while I'm at it, I'll rename this query. So it says unemployment. One other thing I'm going to do is go into the advanced editor. Because what I'm going to do now is reference my named range that I set up in, in my spreadsheet. And so here's how I can do that. So I'm going to create another line above here to say named range. Make that equal to Excel.CurrentWorkbook. Open and close that. And then I'm going to create some, some brackets, some squirrely and then some square brackets. Name is equal to unemployment. And it's important to spell this exactly the same way in the right case because if I've entered um, the variable in, in uppercase, or in lowercase, I have to keep that same case when I'm referencing it in Power Query because it is case sensitive. So if you get it, if you get an error by by doing this, check that you know you're referencing it properly in exactly the same way. So I want to reference the first column, and the first row. And that's why I've structured it this way. And again, this will be in the post related to this video, so you can follow that if you would just want to do a copy and paste of this. But now that I've got that named range in here, I, I no longer have to reference this link. So that I can remove this, remove the quotes, and just reference the named range. So how it works is this is looking at th this variable, which comes from here. And this 
comes from here, from the unemployment variable that I've set up in, in my Excel workbook. So I'm going to hit done. And now the data should, should refresh. And what it does, it's telling me that I need to check this privacy, the privacy settings that I've got. Because I'm sending data now to an external website and receiving it back. So I'm going to set this to public and then hit save. So I'm not, not sending any confidential information, so there's no, no risk here. So now the query updates, and just like before, it's got the same data. It's gone through the same process. The difference is now I've got this named range, and you can see it's referencing that correctly. It's got that in the source, and now pulling it correctly and following the same steps that I did earlier. So that unemployment one is good to go. I'm going to hit close and load, and now it's going to populate this into my spreadsheet. And then once this is done, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rename this so it's uppercase, so it's consistent with my other tab, tab name. And now what I'm going to do is move over to GDP. And for the FRED links, this is going to be a, a, a bit of a quicker process because I can repeat these steps um, easier. So I'm going to go back to From Web, and I'm going to load my Power Query link into here. And there's just a, a bit different uh, transformation that I'm going to need to do here. As you can see, there's some extra rows at the top that I don't need here. So that's one of the things that's going to be consistent for the, the different FRED URLs that I'm using here. So I'm going to load this up. And now what I'm going to do is there's an option at the top to remove rows. So I'm going to remove top rows. And you can see I've got the first 11 rows that I can remove. So that's going to enter in here, hit OK, and those are gone. Now what I'm going to do is rename these columns. So this one's just going to be date, and this one is going to be GDP. And I'm going to convert this to a decimal number, and this one to a date. And the reason this is important, because if you've got data that's in the wrong format, and you're doing calculations or anything like that in, in Power Query, you may end up with, with an error message. So I'm going to rename this as well to GDP. And again, I'll go back into the advanced editor and update my, my source. And so I'm going to paste this over. So I've already populated this one in here. So now I'm referencing the name range of GDP. And again, I can remove the data, including the quotes here, and this is a pretty long, pretty long link here. So it could take a while to update if I had to do that manually. So now, G, or not GDP? Nope, it's the named range. So you want to make sure you're referencing the variable that you're setting up here, not this one. So I'm going to hit done, and if all goes correctly, there we go. So it's updated no issues so that is fine so now as mentioned because i'm using other uh data sources that reference uh the fred data what i'm going to do is right click and duplicate this and now i'm going to do the same thing for some of the other data sources that uh refer to that as as well and one of them is the interest rate so I'm going to go back into, I don't even need to go to the advanced editor, I can just change it on here. Instead of GDP, I'm going to type in interest. See if that pops. that looks to be correct. Go to the end. And let's just make sure that that has updated properly. And actually the one thing I need to do is change the name here. I've got GDP still referenced. I want to change this to interest. And that explains why I was expecting this last step to error out here, but it didn't on me because I didn't change that name. Because one of the one of the downsides in Power Query is unlike Excel, where you make uh, a change to a column name or you move something around, in, in Excel, it'll automatically update your references. But in Power Query, you'll notice this is effectively hard-coded. So it's looking for a GDP column, and that's why it's giving me that error message. Because here... I renamed it to interest, not GDP. So there's one thing to watch out for here is 
that this stuff is effectively being hard coded. So if I change it back to interest, now it's fine. And I've got the date format and I've got the decimal format. So good to go on that. And I'm also going to repeat the, the step now for, for the housing data as well. Before that, let's rename this to interest. Duplicate that. Rename this to housing. And for the named range, reference housing. So you can see how this is a bit easier when using named ranges. You don't have to do it, but obviously it can make it a bit bit easier to update the data and again anytime you're changing the type you've got this step got to look out for that hard coding so I've got that there's still a few things I'm going to need to do to the interest and the housing value it queries but I'll get to that in a little bit once I load this other this other data so now that I'm done with the the Fred the Fred data I'm going to hit close and load and now it's going to load these queries that I've just just created. And what I'm going to do it is load up the, the rest of the queries that I need to do. So again, I'll rename these tabs, set them to uppercase. And now I'm going to use the inflation link from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So again, from web load the URL into there. And these are really just one-time steps that you need to set up. Again, unless you're changing the URL, you, you won't have to do this in the future. So the important part is when you're looking at these different tables to so make sure that you're loading the correct one. In this case, it's table one. So I'm gonna hit transform, transform data and load the inflation, inflation query. Okay. And so again, I'll go back into the advanced editor and create that named range up above. In this case, it's going to be for inflation name range. So again, same data, except now it's pulling in for the inflation. So hit done and let's just make sure that it's loading properly. Good. So we've got that. We've got the year and the, the different months and inflation rate. Rename this to inflation. Now for the inflation data, I'm gonna have to do some additional transformations here because I've got the months going across, which is not what I want. I want it all going down vertically. So one way to do this is to unpivot the data. And by unpivoting, basically, I'm just basically collapsing this into here. And so to do that, I'm going to right click on on the year because I want to unpivot everything else. So the year is fine as in the data is going down is going down vertically. And so I don't need to change anything here. I can just right click and select the option to unpivot other columns. And so now just like that I've got the year, got the month, and I've got the value. So this is a much better format for using in Excel. A couple other things I'm going to do now is create a column for the current period and the previous period. And the reason for this is I'm going to create another table for the inflation so that basically we're looking up the prior period value from the previous period and using that to calculate the difference or the percent change in inflation. So for the current period, what I'm going to do is combine the year and the month. So if I go into the add column section here, there's an option to select custom call. And so I'm going to name this current period. And what I could do is select the year, use the ampersand, and just use a dash here, then an ampersand for the attribute, which is the month. Now this is going to give me an error, and the reason is uh, this is a number, and this is a text value. So obviously this is this can be an issue because uh, Power Query is not sure how to how to combine this. 
So there's a function in Power Query that you can use to convert this into text. And let me just make sure I'm editing at the right spot here. So number dot to text. And then I'll put the year within that. And now if I hit OK, now it's correctly got the, the current period value in there. And now I'm going to create another column for the pre previous period. And for this one, I'm going to again use the year minus one. Put this within parentheses and again use number dot two text. Use the ampersand, connect that with the attribute. So just like that, we've got the current period and we've got the previous period. What I'm gonna do is duplicate this query and I actually don't need this, this last column on here. So I've got, this is basically the same data as I've got here, except this, I've got also the previous period as well. And the point of this is now I'm gonna do a, a lookup in Power Query. And how to do that is I'm gonna select Merge Queries. And so I've got my, my main inflation table that's got the current period and the previous period. And I'm gonna reference that other inflation table that's got this value. So I'm gonna link up is the previous period to this period. The goal is I wanna pull in the value from the previous year into here. And so I'm doing a lookup to accomplish that. So I'm gonna hit okay. And now it gives me this table and I'm gonna click this button to expand out the value. And the value that I want is just that, that value that's coming over from that other table. And so I don't need the prefix. You know, so I, let's just call this previous value just so it's clear. And an easy way to check is really if we look at, let's say January, 1915, we've got 10.1 versus 10. So the prior year period would be January 1914. So January 1914, the value is indeed 10. So that's being put into here. So we know that the lookup's working properly because we've got the current period value and the previous value as well. And so now I can create my the last column that I'm gonna need for this. And that's just gonna to be to calculate the inflation rate and so to, to do that I'm going to take the current value divide it by the previous value and subtract one to get my percent change and okay let's convert this to a percentage so now this looks a bit better this is the actual inflation rate that I, I want to use and so now I don't need these other values anymore. I don't need um, the previous value or, or even the current value because really I'm just after the inflation rate. And I probably don't even need the previous period as well or the current period. I can remove all these columns here. So I've just got the year, say the month, and the inflation rate. The last step I'm going to take is just remove any empty values. So anything that you know may have been 1914, then have a comparable for 1913, and remove any values. There are some half year values in here that I don't want. So I'm just comparing months and years. So that looks to be okay. Now I'm gonna need to follow a similar process for the housing query. Because again, I've got the raw housing numbers, but I wanna have the comparables as well. And so what I can do here is, again, create another column for the, the prior period using the custom column, previous period. And what I'm gonna do here is there's a date dot add years function in Power Query. And sometimes when you insert it, it adds on top of what you already had in there. So just gotta watch for that. But basically what I'm gonna do is select the, the date and for number of years, I'm going to subtract one. Close that out. And now I've got my previous period, 1959 here, 
1958. So I've got both periods in here. So same sort of thing. What I'm going to do is create a lookup. So create a duplicate of that. I'll just put it underneath here. And again, I don't need that previous one. And here what I'm going to do again is merge the queries. So we've got the housing. We're going to reference housing to the previous period linking up to the current date. I've got that. Expand this out. So I've just got that housing housing data. So housing dot one. So again, let's call this previous value. So it's a bit clear and change this one just to the value. And so again, a quick check. We're looking at 1961. So it's got 1183 versus 1460. And that matches up to this one, 1460. So that is correct. Add another column. This one for, let's say, housing percent or housing change, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to take the value divided by the previous value, minus one. And now convert this into a percentage. So we may want to keep the current housing value. It doesn't really matter. But either way, I can remove those other columns and load this in here. So this is this is really optional in case you want to keep the current value versus ju just keeping the, the percent change. So now that this is done, I'm going to hit close and load. And I'm almost done loading the data. The la last piece is the S&P 500 for the stock market. So I've got the housing data, the housing tabs loaded into here. And so I don't need to keep these as, as tables in my Excel workbook. I can delete these and nothing's going to happen. What's going to happen is this is, just becomes a connection only as opposed to actually loading the data. So anything with those number twos, I don't need that because that was really just for, for the lookup. Right, so I've got my inflation in a percentage format here. I've got my housing data as well that has the, the same information, except I've also got the raw values as well. So the last thing to do is pull in the S&P 500 data. So again, let's go to data from web and load in this link from Yahoo Finance, which is just for the S&P 500, just to give you a gauge of how the stock market has has been performing. And so once it's in here, there's, again, this because this is a different data source, there might be different formatting we need to do. So it's just important just to factor factor that in. Because if, if you just duplicate, duplicate, the vet, duplicate the queries, there might be different things you need to adjust for. So here I'll go to transform data again, because I, I need to put in that named range again. And there's some transformations that I can do on here as, as well. So again, let's hop into the advanced editor one more time. And now what I'm going to do is load that link for my named range again. And so this is, this is helpful just to have this have this sort of saved as, as a template that you can reuse over and over again, as opposed to trying to remember the steps. Cause obviously there's a lot of different types of brackets. You got a content, zero column, a, a lot of stuff to reference. So it's a lot easier if you just um, save that, save that link there, or save that text. And so again, reference named range. And if all goes well, we should not get an error message. There we go. So it looks to be okay. So I don't need the volume, the adjusted close. I just, I just want the close. Just a simple close, remove columns. There we go. So we've got the date. We've got the close. Let's rename this to stock market or S&P 500. Doesn't really matter. And now I'm going to hit close and load. And now I've got all my data loaded through Power Query. So that's actually one of the more time-consuming aspects of this. So let's call this, let's actually name this S&P 500 just because that's what it is. So now I've got my data loaded. And now the next step is 
linking this data, converting it into pivot tables, and linking it into the dashboard. So I'm going to start with uh, just the S&P 500 data. So I'm going to look at how it's done over the past three months. So this is going to be a really uh, simple calculation. All I'm going to do is take the most recent value and then use the index function to look at column B and grab, I'm going to say, just the 65th row. Basically, you know, three months, roughly 21, 22 business days in, in a month. So get to about 65. Not terribly precise here. I mean, I just want an approximation. This is obviously going to change often. So 1.78% as of doing this right now. So that's going to give me my three-month return. I'm going to reference this on my dashboard. Easy enough. Next, I'm going to move over to the to the unemployment query, where I'm going to just create a pivot table. And sometimes it doesn't pick this up properly. Normally, Excel does a pretty good job of automatically detecting my table, but for some reason it didn't here. So I'm going to load this in my existing worksheet right here, just so it's all in one place. I hit OK. And then what I'm going to do is select the year and the total. And rather than summing this up, I'm going to summarize them by the average. Remove the grand total. So don't want that. And if you've got formatting like this that you want to fix, so it's a bit more consistent, you can right click, select value field settings. And for the number format, you know, adjust it right here. Because if you just change it on here by just selecting the home tab and selecting the formatting, when you go to refresh, it's going to revert back to that, that other formatting. So if you always want to have it consistent, and in the same format, you want to go in the value field settings to do that. So now I've got my average um, unemployment rate by, by year. Next up, I'll go over to, to the housing tab. And so here again, I'm going to create another pivot table. Insert pivot table. Did not detect the table here. So I'm going to select this, hit enter. Select existing worksheet and load it onto here. So I'm going to load the dates and I'm going to use the raw values as well as opposed to the percent gene. Just for, for graphing purposes, it'll probably be easier to show, show the values. And as you can see, Excel's automatically grouped my, my data here. If I click on this, now I don't want it to group by months. I want to group it by years and by quarters. And I also want it to start from January 1, 2015. I don't want it to go too far back because it's not going to be easy to see on a chart. So I hit OK. Got that. I don't want the stuff before 2015. Now I've still got the sum, so I want to summarize these values by average. And again, value field settings, number format, and can leave that two decimal places. Hit OK, so we've got that. And actually the one thing you may want to change is add that 1000 separator, just so it's a bit easier to read. Hit OK, now it looks a bit better. Now I'll go over to the interest table. Now in this case, because the interest rate, as you can see, historically hasn't changed that often or that frequently, I'm not going to do any changes here, no, no pivot tables, no averages or anything like that. I'm just going to leave it as is. I'll move over to the GDP tab next. And in this case, I'm going to do a, something a little bit different. I'm going to show you how we can just pull some of the most recent uh, data from here. So I'm going to put the period and the growth rate. And what I'm going to use you is use the index function to reference the first column and use the count a function to just grab the last value. Comma one. So as of oops, as of doing this right now, so I can just change this to a short day, whatever format you want. July 1st, 2022. That is the most recent quarter that I've got in here. And so I can do the same 
Same logic here. And now convert this into a percentage. I want to divide this by 100 because this doesn't have this in the right format. So 2.9%. So this is what I got there. So by using the count A function, it's counting the number of cells. And so obviously it's going to go to the last one. So that's how you can manipulate this to pull in what you want. But what if you want the period before that as well? You can't just do um, the count A function. What you have to do is subtract one. But instead of subtracting one, what you could also do is subtract the row value of A1, which is the same thing as one. But the benefit of doing it this way is now as I drag down, now it's going to be row, row A2. So this is going to be minus 2. This one is going to be minus 3. So now you can see you don't have to manually enter in 1, 2, or 3. You can just use that, that logic. And the same thing now can be applied to the growth rate. Again, divide this by 100. And minus 0.6%. So these look about right. So, so that looks to be correct. So we've got that. So that's how you can use just a simple index function. And using the row function, you can automatically increment uh, depending on how far back you want to go. You don't have to hard code one, two, or three. You can just do that. So next up, I'm going to go to the inflation tab. The last one that needs to be set up here. And so here I'm going to set up a pivot table. I'm going to go back to inflation here. Make sure I've got the table selected. Existing worksheet. And as long as your data isn't expanding and there's no potential of overlap between this query and the pivot table, you're safe to put it in close quarters like this. Sometimes when creating dashboards, I might put all my pivot tables on a separate sheet just for the sake of making sure they don't accidentally overlap and cause errors when you're doing an update. But as long as you know, you're always going to be... Uh, your data in this example, let's say, is always going to be confined to, to three columns. There's no need for that because, you know, it's not going to get any wider. There's not going to be any overlap. So in this case, it is fine. And so what I'm going to do here is load the year, the month, and the inflation rate. Now, one thing I'm going to do is update the design of this, show it in a tabular format, repeat all item labels. Let's summarize this as an average. And again, let's go to the value field settings number format. This time, let's use a percentage with two decimal places. It's okay. And now I don't want this going back to 1914. Obviously, that'd be a lot of data to, ch to put on a chart. Instead, what I'm going to do is select the label filters and select greater than or equal to, let's say, 2020. There we go. So now I've just got data going back from there. So not too much in here. I don't need the grand total. I don't need to even subtotal these either. All right, so I'm just looking at that, that, da that data there. And so now that's a lot of the, the grunt work out of the way. Now we can finally go to actually creating the dashboard itself. So put this at the end here. And I'm going to make this black dashboard just to make it a bit, bit smoother. So all, everything is the same uh, default width for the columns and everything. So I'm not changing anything there. What I am going to do is create some headers for each one of the main indicators. So I'm going to use three columns to stretch this out. And let's say create one for unemployment. And want to make this, whoops, just set it to a certain font that you want to use that displays nicely. And I'm going to copy this over. So put a space in between for GDP. Yeah, another space. So copy it, do a space. Let's do interest and then copy. Inflation, housing, and then also one for the stock 
market. It's not showing up on here. Another thing I'm going to do is create a bit of a box here. Say four, four columns wide. To merge this, select the more borders. Select the white outside border. There we go. And now what I'm going to do is copy this over. So again, we've got the same sort of setup. And now we can start pulling in those, those key indicators uh, from the different tabs. So for the case of unemployment, what I can do is use that index function again, go to the unemployment tab. And since I want the most recent unemployment rate, I can select this value, again, all of column C, use the count A function, select this first column, and let's divide it by 100 to get that percent, percent rate. And let's put it to two decimal places, center it, and uh, let's make it a bit, a bit bigger so, so it stands out. Let's say the size 36, same sort of font that I used last time. And so we've got that in there. Now, one other thing that can be useful when you're when you're pulling in data like this is maybe to, to reference it uh, to show when the data was updated. So as of, we use that formula. And I'm going to use the index function again, go back to the unemployment rate, and Again, select the ray, use the count A function to get the most recent month. Column one. Close that and now put a space in between. Use the index function one more time, this time to get the year. Count A, comma one. Close that out. There we go, and now we've got as of November 2022. So we can see when that data was last updated. So that's that's a convenient way to set that up so that we could see, you know, how relevant our information is and if it needs any updating. So now we've got that set up. Now what I can do now is basically repeat repeat the steps for the these other indicators as well and so one thing you may want to do is just uh, copy the formatting over so it's consistent for the GDP this one's going to be a bit easier just because I'm referencing that most recent rate right at the top so it's always going to be at the top and so that's an easy enough one and I can copy the logic for this one a little bit but just that beginning piece so as of and in this case let's go to the GDP tab and we can reference this value except let's put it in a text function so that's in the in a consistent format where we can put it in three letters for the month and then th four placeholders for for the year so just like that, we've got the GDP set up. So Format Painter, if you want to uh, not go one by one when doing the Format Painter, you can double click it and then click one, two, three, four, and then we're done. Now escape to exit out of it. So that way you don't have to do one by one if you don't want to. Whoops, with emerging cells, it can be a bit trickier, but same sort of thing. Just want to make sure you put it in the right spot. There we go. So now we've got the formatting, so we don't have to always change the formatting as we go. And now I can start populating the rest. So for the interest rate, again, I'm going to use the index function. Go here, and again, we're pulling in the most recent interest rate. So we're selecting this for the row number using the count A function. Again, the first column. Close that out. Let's make sure, and I think I probably have to divide this one by 100. There we go. So we've got that. We've got this as of rate, as of date, sorry. And again, the same sort of thing, index function. So for the interest rate, I'm going to select that entire range, use the count A function. First 
first column, and then let's use the text function again, because this is going to be in a date value. And so month. And so now we've got that as well. And again, don't have to worry about the formatting because we've already copied it over. Next up is inflation. Again, same, whoops, same sort of format here where what we're gonna do now is look at the most recent inflation rate. So using the count A function, we can reference that and the first column, and we've got our inflation rate. And then again, for the bottom, as of inflation. So because this one has the month and year spread out, what I'm gonna do is first get in the month and then the year. So array count A one and then let's put a space and then index the year count A column one and let's take a look and that looks to be good as well. And then we've got the housing where we're going to select the the percent change in this case. So I've got the raw values, that's what I'm going to chart out. But for the indicators, I want to see the percent change. So I'm going to pull in the value from column C. So count A, column 1, minus 8.83 as of. And then for the housing, this one is just has the date value. So we can select that use the count a function boom and now this time i'm going to use the text function so really it's you got to be flexible in how you're you're doing this because every data set could potentially be different so and this is 1959 that is not what i want so what i will probably need to do here is let's edit up this query because I forgot that one step in removing those blank values. So if I go to housing, let's just remove empty. Let's make sure there's nothing else in here. Good, and I think that should fix my problem. So let's make sure that one is, is good. So once the qu query updates, there we go. So we got rid of that. So now it should have October 2022 and 8.83%. There we go. So that's that's the benefit of having that is to make sure you're you're referencing the right data. So even though the percentage is right because we're blanks, it was stopping where it should have, but the data set was looking at the range. So that's one of the ways that you can you can catch sort of issues like this is just by you know looking at the data, and making sure that it looks correct. For the S and P 500, for the stock market, this is going to be a bit easier because you've already got this data right in here so it's loaded in there easy to reference and for this one as of this is also going to be just referencing that most recent date we've got that and so we just want to put this again in a text format here and then let's just put it as month day and then one, two three four there we go, December 13th, 2022. And it doesn't matter when you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about just numbers, obviously the casing doesn't matter wh whether it's an uppercase Y or D, it doesn't matter in this case, because we're just looking at the numbers. Now, one other thing I'm gonna do uh, to these indicators is add some conditional format. So basically, if they're over or under a certain threshold, I want them to show green. If they are, you know, not looking good, I want them to highlight red. So by default, I'm gonna set all these to red. So I'm gonna apply red highlighting, and let's say use a dark red uh, border as, as well. So by default, they're all gonna be showing up as red. So I'm gonna add some conditional formatting rules to say, okay, if they're above a certain threshold or below a certain threshold, then they're gonna show as green. So to set up some conditional formatting, click on the conditional formatting button, hit a new rule, 
And I'm going to use a formula because that's the easiest way to, to set this up. So I'm going to say equals. So if this value is less than, let's say, 0 0.5, less than 5%, then I want it to highlight as green. So let's use the screen and the border. Let's say a darker green. Hit OK. Actually, the font should be white as well just so it stands out better. There we go. So now 3.7%. So positive looks correct. And now what I'm going to do is use the format painter here, copy this over here. And now what I just need to do is manage that rule. So we're still referencing the right range, but now instead of referencing C8, actually I just want to wipe this out completely. And let's say as long as the GDP is more than 1%. I'm going to say that's that's good. That's green. Hit OK. Apply. And it stays green. Again, let's copy the formatting to the interest rate. Manage rules. We've got the right range. Let's edit this to say, OK, if this value is, you know, less than or equal to, let's say, 2%. So in this case, that condition is not met. So this should revert to red which does. So that looks good. Copy the format painter once more. Manage the rules. Again, make sure we got the right range. Edit this. And now let's change this to say, okay, if the inflation rate is less than or equal to 0 0.02, then it's green. Obviously, that one's going to stay red. Format painter for the housing. For the housing starts. Manage the rules got the right range and then let's change this to say okay if this is just over one percent right hit apply and then the last one be in the stock market so conditional formatting manage rules got the right range edit and let's say if this is just greater than one percent that is a positive hit okay and apply Okay, so just like that, we've got some indicators now. They're dynamic enough that it'll automatically update. We know when they will update, and we know whether they're doing well or not. Now we're on to the last step, and this is actually populating the charts for these different, different indicators. So we have so, something that resembles more of a dashboard. So I'm going to start with GDP, because that's one of the main ones. And so... What I'm going to do is chart this chart this table out. So insert, and I can select from one of the charts here. So I'm going to use a just a simple bar chart here. I'm going to cut and paste this onto my dashboard, put it into here, and so you could select some default design uh, layouts that you want here. And then what we can do is adjust them afterwards. So one thing I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to change a lot of things here. So let's just format the chart area here. The fill color can be blank just because I've got, um, got, got already a black background, so I don't need to do any adjustments. I want to format this axis as well, just so the, the labels are not next to the axis. But no, we don't want high, we want low. So off to off to the side a little bit here. And format this axis so that this one is also this one in this case is high. Change our name so it shows GDP. And what I also want to do is adjust these these grid lines. So right now the line is pretty white. It stands out a bit too much. So I want it to be a bit softer there. So it's a bit more gradual. And then let's also get rid of the border and adjust this axis so that it's reading as a text axis. So that way I don't have every single one of those dates because if it's reading as a date, then Excel has the tendency to fill in any any blanks and assume you're you're missing missing data. And one thing you can do on the design is also change the colors if you want. So let's say I want a, I wanted a green 
layout on here, I could do that as well. And if there's ever components of a chart that you're missing, like let's say I want the horizontal grid lines, I can go to add chart element under grid lines, primary, major, horizontal. All right, so right now, let's adjust these grid line colors uh, again. So it's a solid color, but again, it's got that that almost almost black black look. So it's so it's a bit uh, this is a bit more subtle. Doesn't stand out as much. So let's say we've got that. So that's our first chart for for GDP. Now I'm going to move on to the unemployment tab. So I've got my pivot table here. Insert. And in this case, let's just do a simple column chart here. Load that into here. And again, let's do no fill. And because this is from a pivot table, we want to get rid of these pivot table buttons. So uncheck that. Don't need the legend for the total. Let's call this average unemployment rate. Change the font color to white. And actually, maybe this is, uh, let's change this design layout. Just, it's a little bit different. There we go. That's a bit of a more similar look to what I've got on, on the chart to the left. And now I can get rid of the fill. That's where some of these designs can come in handy, especially if you're producing similar, similar type of charts. Uh, for the grid lines, again, same sort of thing. Let's use that more subtle black color. So in some cases, the defaults aren't what what you want. I don't want to crowd legends too much. And a lot of the, these design issues obviously are going to come down to your preference, how you want the data to show. Now, if you got these labels, I, I don't like these diagonal labels. So what I like to do is format this alignment so that it's at a custom angle. There we go. So if you do need to squeeze in a bit more space, you know, you can stretch the chart out as you want. Whoops, it's a bit too crowded. Or you could shrink the font even if if you wanted to. Let's say just size eight. There we go. So that's still a bit cramped. There we go. And let's say I wanted to add my data labels up top. And there we go. We've got my unemployment rate. Let's change the color, uh, maybe to a yellow, just so it looks a little bit different. Have enough variety in there. Next up, I'm going to plot the S and P 500. So insert, this is a good one to use as a line chart. So control X, control V again, and let's go to one of our templates here. Again, let's use that similar black one. The benefit of using no fill as opposed to solid fill, because if we put a solid fill of black, you'll notice now it's gonna overlap with that chart. And if we wanted to squeeze in a bit of space, that's gonna be a problem. If I use no fill, then it becomes transparent. So now you have that overlap effect. So that's one of the reasons why I like using no fill on, on these charts. So get rid of the border. Again, let's modify our, our grid line so they're a solid line. It, it remembers that black color that I was using. So that one is, is fine. Now the one thing with actually the S&P, the, the number formatting, I'm gonna modify this so that these are Columns, there we go, that looks a bit, looks a bit better. And actually let's get rid of the decimals. So we've got that in there. Now with the S&P, you know, unless there's a massive crash in the markets, it's not gonna hit 3000. And so what I wanna do here is modify this axis. You can set a minimum. By default, it starts from zero, but that's probably not practical. And if I change it to 3500, now the chart has you know more of a movement it's easier to see so sometimes you may want to update that just so you've got um you know a better looking chart so let's call this s p 500 and stretch this out a bit so it's a bit closer in line with the other ones and i'm going to do a something a little bit different for this chart i'm going to add a glow effect all right so there is an option here for glow so there's a preset i'm going to use this one here and let's change this to size 11. So a bit of a way to make your chart stand out a little bit more, just in case you want it to pop a bit, right? So that, that just makes it a little bit different. Now I've got our three charts for the GDP, average unemployment, s and I'll just adjust these a little bit so these headers, these titles are more closely aligned to one another. 
right? So that looks about, looks pretty close there. So we've got that. So now what I'm gonna do is now create a chart for the interest rate. And for the interest rate, this is one where I actually didn't do anything, no pivot tables, no summaries, just because, again, there's not a whole lot of movement here as you can see. So control X, control V, let's put it right under this one. Change the design, something like this. Again, let's go no fill, no, no background. Let's do a solid line. Okay, so I'm not sure what that warning was about, but as you can see, you've got the interest rate. Oops. And so what we can do is stretch this one out a little bit more just so it stands out a bit more and by default you see the the formatting of this is it's got some random dates december 16th and that sort of stuff and that's really not what i want to see so there's an option here for the number formatting that's what i was looking at or so right now it's got month day year that's not what i want i just want the year so i don't really care at what point in the year there we go. So now it's a bit cleaner. I just have that. I've already got a blue one in here, a blue chart. So I'm going to change this to, you know, maybe a different color. And I can actually format this manually, actually. I can do a solid line. Let's do a purple line. There we go. So now we've got a bit of a different layout for, for the interest rate on here. Okay, so moving on to the next one. And that is going to be the inflation rate. So the inflation rate, let's do a little bit different and let's do an area chart for this one. So control X, control V, and switch over to again, one of these darker backgrounds, no fill, no border, get rid of the field buttons, get rid of the total. And let's get rid of these lines as well, just so it's a bit, just so it's a bit cleaner and easier to look at. Stretch this out a bit so it's similar in size to the one above it, right? Want to make it as as consistent as as I guess possible. Add a title for the inflation rate. And so this one was a bit bigger. So let's shrink this down to 14. It's more consistent. In this case, let's use a, a solid fill color. This time let's use maybe a dark red color and we can add some transparency to this. So if you wanted to have an effect where you can see the grid lines behind, again, we can go to add chart element, grid lines, primary vertical, right? So you can see a bit of that transparency in there and so we can see the inflation rate easily. Last up now is the housing chart. So we've got our pivot table in here, ready to go. Insert, and for this one, let's use a line chart with, with the markers. Control X to cut and paste over here. We've got that in here. Now let's stretch this out a bit. Select a dark design, no fill, no line delete this and let's get rid of the field buttons and again let's adjust these colors because these lines are a bit a bit harsh don't want it to stand out too much there we go so a bit more subtle and actually I'll get rid of the the vertical ones just because I don't know that they're um, terribly so there we go that that works, that works a bit better. Housing starts, and we can adjust the, the color of this one as well. Let's use a solid, let's use an orange, orange color. And there's a separate option for the marker as well. So we can use a solid fill as well. So let's keep it at orange as well, right? So we can do, even do a dark orange, but you can play around with that on here. So there's one for the line and one for the marker. So if you wanted the same, same color, there we go, that's a bit a bit smoother there. And there's also 
for the marker. There's also a border out there. You see a bit of a bluish line. I want to get rid of that. And actually, it's not. The outline looks like it is. There's still a glow effect on there. So I want to make sure I've got... Get rid of that. So we've still got that blue glow effect. There we go. So now that's gone. And so for the housing starts as well, you may be tempted to adjust the axis here just because it looks like it hasn't been even close to 800 recently. So you might be tempted to change this to to that just just so there's a bit more movement on the housing starts but again it really optional but at this point it doesn't look like it should get anywhere below that anytime soon so pretty safe assumption to to make that change because excel will automatically default some of these uh ranges for you especially especially when it comes to um anything where there isn't a, a set range so it'll default it to zero so that's 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 the dashboard similar to the one that i showed you at the beginning the last thing you may want to add is just the title so i called it economic dashboard you know maybe set it across the length of your range here and you know that there we go so that's pretty similar to the one that i showed you at the beginning so as you can see there was a lot of work initially in collecting the data because that's that's really the, the most important piece. But once you've got that loaded, you know you can essentially set it and forget it. One of the main advantages of using uh, Power Query in this case is if I go to the data queries and connections, I've got all those connections in there. And so let's say at a later date you wanted to update um, your dashboard. So the easy way to do that just go to refresh all. It's gonna update all your queries here. It's gonna run through all the steps that I showed you that included calculating those year over year averages and that, all that sort of stuff. So you can see it's all been loaded. So at a future date, you could just rerun the query and it'll up, up, update this data for you, update all the charts, all the pivot tables, everything like that. So that's the benefit of using named ranges and all that, all that stuff in there. You don't have to update the URL because as mentioned, if you don't use name ranges, then you may potentially have to update some of these URLs because as you can see, there's date, dates in there. I've used this date variable in here, but if you don't do that, th then you may potentially have to update the data manually. So setting up the variables and setting up the Power Query links can be a bit cumbersome and time consuming initially when you're first setting it up, but obviously it pays off in the end by making it easier uh, to update the data. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a link related to this video on my website. You can follow along there. We're, we've got the links to these different data sets as well. And obviously you can use different ones or more, however you want. This just want, I, I just wanted to show you how you can do this using Power Query, using variables, and conditional forming, a whole lot of stuff jam-packed in this dashboard, the many different things you can do to make your charts look subtly different from, from one another so that you, you know they're all a bit different and they help stand out a bit. So hope you, hope you learned a lot from this and found this video useful. Thank you for watching.